interesting business. Okay, so my favorite protein is called BMP2. So I was looking for a nice picture I could put up to show you. So I googled BMP2 and got this. <laughs> and I kept looking. BMP2, infantry combat vehicles. I found vehicles splashing into water and tearing through deserts and dressed in camouflage to hide in the sand. All BMP2s going through lakes, going through snow, and then finally got to this one. This is the one I'm talking about. It's a protein called BMP2. Um, oh, and it looks like we've lost some formatting, which may affect some other things. Oh, well, you can <laughs> figure it out. BMP2 um, is a protein I'm going to come back around to in a few minutes, but I wanted to start first by telling you a little bit more about the path I followed that brought me to science, just because I know some of you, like I said, are considering maybe a career in science or going to graduate school. So when I was a freshman, I went to BYU and was a freshman and was getting to the end of my freshman year and trying to pick a major. And uh, I was down on paper as an English major because I love to read and I imagined I would be able to read all day long, the greatest books ever written. And then I found out that you actually have to write about everything you read and that's kind of, I wasn't so excited about the English major anymore after that. I'm wondering what I could do and I heard a professor speak about gene therapy. And this was, well, decades ago and gene therapy wasn't happening yet but it was you know, we could see how it could be done. He talked about cutting and pasting genes and this idea that I've got a much better pointer than that. There we go. This idea that we could take a therapeutic gene where a mutation has caused a disease, we could take that gene, put it into a virus, give it to a person and treat their disease that way. Or some other ways, we could take cells out of their body or take stem cells and modify those cells genetically and put it back in and treat a disease. So, like I said, it was all kind of pie in the sky, but I heard that and just thought that is the coolest thing ever. How do I major in that? How do I go into that? And I, I ended up changing my major that day, and that's what I've been doing. So once I decided I wanted to do science, then I realized that it would be really good if I were doing research as an undergraduate. And I got into a research lab working, I was with Dr. Um, Bob Segmiller at BYU, working on something called the Pierre Robin syndrome. These little kids, um, you can see they're cute as can be, but you can see they all have something unusual, very small chin. Can you see that? And they have cleft palate that you can't see. So um, we were working with some mice that are good models of Pierre Robin syndrome. Now these are mouse embryos, but that's what a normal mouse looks like. A Pierre Robin syndrome mouse has a much shorter lower jaw and you can see the tongue protruding and it has a cleft palate. And if you look at those, oh, one more, this one was just a chance that we, we got a couple of these that had no lower jaw. It let us answer this question. We were wondering, um, is the cleft palate in these mice caused because there's something cellularly wrong? These palate cells just can't move to the right place and fuse? Or could it be a mechanical problem? caused by the jaw being fouled up. And these mice answered that question. Here's what we saw when we looked at them from the inside. So this is a section cut about this way through the mouse so you can look up at the palate. So this is a Pierre Robin mutant mouse and what you see there should be a palate and instead you're looking right into the sinuses. So you can imagine in a baby that causes serious problems with feeding and a lot of other things. The mouse that had no jaw genetically was the same as the others, but without a jaw, the palate had closed. So that told us that it was a mechanical problem. The tongue was actually getting up in the way because the jaw was so small, the tongue had nowhere to grow and it got in the way of the palate. Now I just throw that in because it shows you the kind of research that can be done and that had a huge effect, I, I should say can be done by an undergraduate, and had a huge impact on my ability to get into graduate school later. You here can get involved in some research projects and um, probably on this campus, I know some other local campuses, or there are programs all around the country called SURF, Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowships. If you're interested in going into science, you ought to Google SURF 
And kind of like the BMP2 experiment, you'll get lots of like waves and pictures like that. But you will eventually get to summer undergraduate research fellowships. <clears throat> and if you start tracking that down, you'll find opportunities to apply all different places where you can go away for a summer, do an internship, and learn to do some hands-on research in a great lab that will make a big difference going forward. I went to graduate school and focused on something completely different. The metal chromium, it causes cancer. What you're seeing there is a picture from Hudson County, New Jersey. And this is a place that has been historically the center of chromium production for lots of different industries. And they've dumped all sorts of it into the ground. And when it rains, the water then leaches, as it comes up, it leaches the chromium up out of the ground. And they get these brilliant yellow puddles. And then those dry up and you've got what they call chromate blooms on the surface. And I was looking into how this chromium causes cancer and was able to show that chromium, this part was already known, that it gets into DNA. See that little point there? That's a metal that's worked its way in between the DNA strands. But what I was able to show is that when that's in there, it keeps the DNA from being replicated. So the enzyme that's supposed to copy the DNA so cells can divide comes along, it's chugging along, copying DNA, runs into that, and it just has to stop. It has no way of passing it. And so when the replication's stopping at wrong places, then you end up getting genetic mutations as the cell kind of scrambles and tries to repair things and find a way past that troubled spot. So that was graduate school. Then I did a postdoc. If you're interested in academia or um, working, like doing science at a university, you will probably do a postdoc. And that's three or four years after a PhD program. And in mine, I was working on understanding how genes get expressed in some tissues and not others. Do you know that every cell in your body has all the same genes? And yet you've got cartilage and liver and skin and hair, all the different types of tissues. The reason is because certain genes are turned on in some cell types and often others. So how they're controlled really goes right to the foundation of, of development, human development. Also plays a big role in cancer because if genes that sh are normally expressed only in embryos that contribute to an embryo going really fast, I mean, think how much you grew from the time you were one cell to the time you were born. What if you kept growing at that rate? The building wouldn't hold you, right? So those, the things that cause that kind of growth have to shut down. If they get turned back on later, then we're talking about cancer. So my work specifically is focused on cartilage genes. And we did a lot of work. These aren't my mice. These are from the same institution. Um, but the work that we did was taking parts of genes that we thought were the controllers that would make a gene turn on only in cartilage. And we'd attach it to a reporter gene that made a blue color put it into mice, make transgenic mice, and then you can grow up these mice and look at them. And if the cartilage is blue, then we did succeed in capturing a part of a gene that said, turn on in cartilage. And if it wasn't, then we didn't. And most often we found some intermediate. You know, some of the cartilage was blue, maybe it worked in the digits, but not in the ribs or, you know, not in the vertebrae. I got one, one experiment we did where it looked like all the cartilage was perfectly blue, but then there was a really dark stain right around this part of the skull too. So those things help us figure out where are the important places in a gene that are used to control that gene and turn it on and off. And now we come back around to what I'm doing now. So just a quick overview to kind of help you see how the path goes from undergraduate training to, to becoming a scientist. So BMP2, this protein, BMP2, BMP stands for bone morphogenetic protein, and it was named that because when it was first discovered, they found you could take this protein, inject it into muscle, and you get a little chunk of bone where you'd put it. So it causes bone to develop. Now, it turns out it does lots of other things, but that name has stuck. That's what it's called. Conventional BMP2, I have to explain because the rest of the work I'm going to tell you about is a different form, a variant of BMP2 that we've been working on and that we discovered in my lab. So first, the conventional form. It's a secreted growth factor. That means it's made by one cell, illustrated here. And these little red circles are, represent the BMP2. It's secreted into the matrix between cells, and then it binds to receptors on the surface of other cells. What you're seeing there is a cell surface receptor. BMP2 binds there. It doesn't go into the cell. 
By binding out there and staying outside the cell, it causes changes on the inside of the receptor part that then trigger pathways that one triggers another, triggers another through a cascade that ends up affecting gene expression in the nucleus. There's the nucleus, Think changes happen there, but the BMP2 itself is out here. We found BMP2 staining in the nuclei of several of our cell lines. And uh, we were, had also done some work with, uh, you know what, I'm not even going to back up through all of it. We found, <laughs> I just started down this path, but it's kind of a long story. I'm going to stop right there um, and just tell you that we're working with Craig Tulin, who's here now um, on mass spectrometry, looking at nuclear proteins. And what we found was that we had BMP2 in in mixed in with our nuclear proteins. We thought it was mixed up. We, you know, we gotten contamination in our proteins or something because BMP2 is secreted, we were looking in the nucleus. But then we started looking closer at cells and saw this. If you stain, so TOPRO3 stains nuclei, it's a DNA stain, stains nuclei red. BMP2, this is an antibody that binds to BMP2 protein. And you can see in three different cell lines, it's pretty strong in the nucleus, less so in these cells, really strong in these. You merge the pictures and you can see wherever there's yellow, it means red and green are superimposed. It was really there. So the question is, how can that be? What is it? And lots of research went into this, what I'm going to tell you in about three minutes. So this right here represents the structure of BMP2, not the nuclear form we found, but the traditional, the conventional form. And right there you have a signal peptide, propeptide, mature BMP2. The signal peptide, lots of proteins that are secreted from the cell, basically every protein that's secreted from the cell is going to have a signal peptide at its front end. As that protein is translated, the protein starts being made, the signal peptide has this unique sequence. It's recognized by other proteins that say, oh, this one needs to be secreted. They take that protein to the endoplasmic reticulum and launch it on its way through the secretory pathway to leave the cell. So it then gets um, cleaved off. As this protein is moving through the secretory pathway, a second cut happens right here. So altogether, this is a proprotein. After it gets cut here, it releases that then that's the mature BMP2. That's what leaves the cell and binds to receptors and does all the, this growth factor signaling stuff. Now, we, <laughs> you can't see it. There's an S down here, NLS. What just showed up there stands for nuclear localization signal. When we found nuclear staining and, and BMP2 in the nuclei of these cells and our cell extracts, our nuclear extracts, we started to wonder if it really could be possible after seeing it several different times. We thought maybe it's not contamination, maybe it's real. We looked at the sequences of the proteins and it turns out that there is in fact a nuclear localization signal, which is an amino acid sequence, just it's um, part of the protein, embedded right in the protein, right about here at that cut site. So um, if the protein were to be cut right here to release mature BMP2, no nuclear localization signal. But, that really sounds like there's a bird in this room. <laughs> like, where did it go? Okay, but right here we also found um, an alternative start codon. So proteins are made by starting at a start codon, chaining amino acids together to the end. The start codon codes for the first amino acid that's up here. If you start translation further down the mRNA at an alternative downstream start codon, which is used, we're able to show, what you get is a protein that's going to be shorter and uh, this protein by not having the signal peptide doesn't get taken to the endoplasmic reticulum and routed through the secretory pathway which means it never runs into the enzymatic scissors that would have cut it this whole thing together is the nuclear BMP2 so that's how it's made question is does it do anything? And um, we decided to find that out by making a mouse. We found a mutation. This was kind of tricky. We wanted to come up with a mutation that would inactivate nuclear BMP2 but not foul up the secreted growth factor. And the reason for that is that people had already knocked out the secreted growth factor 
and it causes terrible problems in development. The embryos, mouse embryos, only survive to day seven out of about 19 or 20, and they have major heart deformities. I mean, they have serious abnormalities, and because they die at day seven, you don't even know what else would have been affected if they lived longer. So we had to find a way of making sure that protein, secreted protein, still worked, but only the nuclear form was affected. The knockouts that other people had done, they just knocked out the whole gene, which meant both proteins were gone. So we found, first of all, that we couldn't do what we hoped. We hoped we could just make a mutation in here, but these four amino acids, R-E-K-R, -E it's an arginine, glutamic acid, lysine arginine, that's where those enzymatic scissor scissors recognize so they can cut and release the mature secreted growth factor. So if we fouled up anything in that region, no cutting of the protein, no growth factor. Doesn't work for us. But we were able to find a three amino acid change we could make right here. These are part of the nuclear localization signal. This RKR and that K plus these two amino acids up here. If we just change these three into three alanines, you still get the secreted growth factor made. Cutting happens normally, the growth factor is secreted, but the form that starts here doesn't go to the nucleus. So it's made, but it doesn't go to the nucleus, and we can find out what happens when it's missing in the nucleus. So we made some mice that way. Um, if you're familiar with looking at these kind of charts and how knockout mice are, are made, great. If that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. The key is that we ended up putting a three amino acid change right into the mouse genome. So they still have their BMP2 gene in the normal place, it's normal sequence, makes a normal protein, except three amino acids are changed. And now it makes a nuclear BMP2 that can't go to the nucleus. Well, this is the worst possible news you can get when you make a knockout mouse. When you're making a mouse, it takes months, literally, um, like sometimes can be up to a year if you're having trouble putting the whole construct together and you're hoping for some hideous deformity because then you could say this gene controls head development so I have a headless mouse you know something like that it would be really you'd appreciate that and feel good about it and confident in where you're going if you get a mouse that doesn't seem to have anything wrong then it could be that um, your protein doesn't matter Okay, that's one possibility. We just knocked out a protein that has absolutely no function. Another explanation is there might be another gene that compensates when this one's lost. How do you figure that out? I mean, you really can't figure any of it out without a whole lot more experiments. So we started looking closer at them. Um, they were normal in size, normal body weight. We weighed them every which way you can imagine, normal f fertility. Um, normal skeletal structure, we analyzed their skeletons, and this one was actually really good news. The secreted growth factor plays a huge role in bone and cartilage development, and so if we had accidentally fouled up the secreted growth factor, we would have seen a difference in their skeletal structure. There wasn't one. So that was great news. What, you know, any change we do see, we can attribute to nuclear BMP2. Um, we dissected them, looked at everything internally, I was friends with a postdoc. When I was doing my postdoc at the, in Houston at the MD Anderson Cancer Center, there was a guy down the hall who had made a knockout mouse. His mice looked completely normal. He was the most depressed guy you've ever seen for like eight months. And he kept breeding him. He's thinking maybe when they're older I'll see something. Maybe it was even more than that. It was so long and all of us suffered with him because <laughs> he was so sad. And then he started looking internally and he found that his mutant mice had these enormous bladders, distended bladders, like urinary bladder, that were like eight times the normal volume. And there it was. Hooray, he's got a project. He was able to go forward and discover all this stuff about what that gene does. So we looked at everything internally, but we couldn't see anything that jumped out at us. So then we started the crazy mouse tests. <laughs> And this is from a book, we didn't make these up, people really do these things when they can't find anything easy wrong with their mouse. This one, you dip the mouse's feet in ink and then you let them walk across filter paper. This unfortunately is not our data. I put it here as an example. But this mouse, you can see the normal mouse wild type, the back feet step pretty much where the front feet were, it's a normal gait. This one, they're kind of all over, this is a heterozygote. 
The homozygous mutant is just staggering. You can hardly tell their footprints. The feet must be kind of bent or I don't know what. Like I said though, not our mouse. Our mouse, the mutants and wild types walked just fine. We had our mice swim. Because if they swim funny, like maybe they only turn left or something like that, it can tell you there might be some neurological problems. And boy, we counted the different times they're turning which way. And you know, we think we'd see something, but it's, it's like when you flip a coin 10 times and you get six heads and four tails. Ah, oh, there's a difference. And then you do it again and it's six tails and four heads. And oh. So it was like that. There was nothing. This one, we finally found something. On this one, what you do is you take the mouse and you put it right side up on a wire cage lid. You give the lid a shake so the mouse grabs on tight and then you turn it upside down. And the mouse will hang on upside down. They even kind of move around the lid and they'll stay there. You do this over their open cage, which has bedding, so it's soft. So when they fall out, they're not hurt. When they fall, you know, they just land in a big pillow. But they don't know that. So they hold on as long as they can, and when they finally fall off, then you see, you know, it tells you something about, it's actually a neuromuscular test. Here's what we got with our mice. Here we have over six weeks time. So every week for six weeks, <clears throat> we took a bunch of wild types and mutants. The wild types held on this long on average. Mutants, much less. Hooray, we have something. So <clears throat> at that point, we talked to Chad Hancock, who's also at BYU. He's a muscle biologist and said, you know, how do we measure muscle function? What could be going on in these mice? And he <clears throat> helped us do some experiments with mouse muscle. He's got a setup where you can stimulate a muscle electrically and measure the force it generates. So you've got a, a force transducer, it's called. So what you see here, these peaks represent a single muscle contraction. So right here, electrical stimulation, and this is measuring the force. So force goes up, and what's happening molecularly at this point, by the way, um, when, a muscle stimulation is, when a muscle contraction is stimulated, is calcium comes out of its storage place in the muscle. It's stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, so it floods out of the storage base, and until you reach peak contraction, and then it gets pumped back into the SR, and the contraction relaxes. So our wild type mice, there's a simple, you know, single stimulated contraction. Mutants, what difference do you see there? It's coming down slower. You see that? What we do is measure the half relaxation time. So how long does it take in, and these are not seconds, these are like milliseconds, but how long does it take for it to be halfway relaxed. So full contraction is here. So halfway, you know, I'm going to draw a line about there. And then I'm going to say also a vertical line from that peak point. And I can measure the distance in time right there from this peak point till it's half relaxed. Peak point to half relaxed was quite a bit longer. It ended up being about 42 to 48 percent longer. And so that's just a sample so you can see a close-up of one contraction but if you do um, stimulations over time so here now we have multiple stimulation over up to 1200 seconds wild type this is their half relaxation time much shorter and the mutants consistently longer so every stimulation it just takes a while to come back down now imagine what that would mean then if you stimulate faster and faster and faster Okay, you've got a, a peak that goes up and then comes down. And if you stimulate before it's come all the way down, you re-stimulate, it's going to go up higher and come down and higher until the muscle reaches. There is a, a maximum force it can generate. It won't go any higher. So it's going to level out. Now, if the relaxation is slower, <clears throat> then you'll get those peaks merging even sooner. That's what you're seeing here. So um, wild type mouse, these are frequency of stimulations, meaning pulses per second. So if you start out, you know, at, what do we start out? 10 pulses per second um, and measure the maximum force or the actually percent of maximum force generated. <coughs> so, excuse me, at 10 pulses per second, you've got contraction, relax, contract, relax like that. As they get closer and closer, you get to, you know, really close together until it just levels out. With the mutants, that happens much sooner. 
they're taken, they still have the same maximum contraction force, but they get to that point much faster because their peak is so wide. What does that sound like? If that were to happen to you, what do you think that would feel like? I'm just guessing, but I guess Charlie Horse. You know, something like that, where you've got a cramp that just will not let go and every muscle fiber is fire, firing at once. Our mice do that. So, um, they, yeah, I put in quotes, mutant muscles cramp. It's a bit of a stretch to connect it from this molecular and, and cellular stimulation, but to me that makes sense. That's what it would be, mice that do that. And there are humans, by the way, with a syndrome something like that. Um, it's called Bloom syndrome. And they, any kind of, even walking, any kind of exercise, their muscles cramp very easily. Or if they make a fist and squeeze it, then they can't let go. And sometimes it even happens like in their faces. So it is possible. We've seen it in humans. So trying to put pieces together and summarize where we are to this point, muscle contraction and relaxation are modulated by calcium. I had a great undergraduate in my lab, Ryan Cordner was his name who was thinking about this, started doing some other research on his own, and then came to me with this idea. Neuron signaling is also regulated by calcium, that intracellular calcium movement. And so he wondered, well, maybe they are going to have some other abnormality, like memory problems. That's not the sort of thing you're going to find, you know, looking at a mouse in a cage. But he did enough research to figure out how we could test that. The Morris water maze is what he proposed and what we ended up doing. So the way this works is you take a tank and you fill it with water with powdered milk in it. So basically you're filling it with milk. So the water is opaque and the mouse can't see and you have in there a platform that's submerged. You put the mouse in, it searches. Mice swim really well but they hate it. So they'll swim until they accidentally find the platform and then they stay there. And then you do it again, and a mouse, what you see here is illustrated um, just as it's learning. So first time in, it's going to swim all over, finally find the platform and stop there. After it's learned where it is, it just goes straight to the platform. Sensible mouse. Um, I wonder if this will work. I put a link here. Didn't get a chance to try it before, but let's just see what happens. If I try to go to YouTube. It looks like it's going to work. Okay, so what you're seeing there, I've got to start it over because it's really short, but go back. Okay, so everywhere the mouse has been, this is a mouse that's been trained that there's a platform right in the middle of that tank. Now they've moved the platform. <laughs> see that? It's like, I know it was here, it was here, it's somewhere right here, just look again, look again. Now see how it starts going a little wider? You know, it starts doing over time a few loops further out because it's now starting to think, well, maybe it's someplace else now and you get these out here and those and gradually it's getting bigger, but it knew where to start looking. That's the mouse, that's the Morris water maze for mice. No. Back to this. So here's what we got with the Morris water maze. And this was really interesting. We threw in an extra twist that people do that wasn't shown on that first one. We did the training, just like I said. So over seven days, every mouse swam three times a day in the maze with the platform always in the same location. You also have to make sure that the people who are there and the room you're in, everything's the same because the mouse gets visual cues from what's around it. So if you stand on one side one day and the other side the next, the mouse is getting cues from where you stand. So did all that. The mutant and wild type mice, um, you let them swim till they find it and there was no statistical difference at all by day seven. Day eight, we did something different. We moved the platform to the opposite side. So right here, completely opposite in the tank. Put the mice in and here's where we started to see something different. The first time we tried it, both mice swam, and when I say both mice, I mean we had lots of each kind of mice, uh, each kind of mouse, and these are averages. But both wild type and mutants swam first to where it used to be, looked around there, and then expanded and started looking all over the tank till they found the new platform. The wild type mouse after that now is the one in black here. Next time, faster. By the third try in the same day, it's down to 15 seconds to find it right about where it was 
after seven days of practicing with it in the other location. It quickly learned the new location went straight to it. The mutant couldn't learn the new location, at least not in three tries. Second try, instead of like even searching, so what, what you would normally expect is it goes to the new place or it goes to the old place, right? There's some memory. The mutant mice just searched randomly everywhere until they found it. Third try, same thing. There was no searching strategy of trying to focus in a certain quadrant of the tank or anything. So that tells us they have memory problems. There's a learning and memory problem here. Very interesting. Now, um, another test that Ryan did is called the Novel Object Recognition Test. In this test, you put objects, three different objects, in a box or a chamber, and you let the mouse explore the three objects. And you measure the time that the mouse spends on each one. And then you take the mouse out and you switch one of the objects for something new. A normal mouse will go back in, see, oh yeah, I've seen that one, I've seen that one, really spend more time on the new object, knows that it's new. Here's what we found when we tried this. So these are the acquisition trials. So wild type and mutant mice, there was not a significant difference in the time they spent on each object. And then we did the swap out, and this, this is measured as a recognition index, which requires a bit of calculating because the mice also will spend some time sniffing around the edges of the box, and you have to take that out of your calculation. Just focus on their time on the three objects. Normal is wild type. That's how much time they're spending on the new object. The mutants didn't even register that that new one was any different. They treated all three of them as if they were brand new. So again, it's a learning, a memory problem. They've, they've lost this recognition memory, or it's weaker. Third thing, now we went more at the cellular level. The first two tests were behavioral. We worked with Jeff Edwards at BYU, who's a neuroscientist, and does long-term potentiation studies, which is a way of measuring um, what we think of as forming a new neural pathway. So this works. Um, when, when memories are formed, or neural pathways, here's what's going on. So we've got two neurons coming together. This one is releasing neurotransmitters into the space between, and they're binding to receptors on the other cell, the receiving cell. You work on a pathway, and, and your brain works, it involves electrical stimulation, basically. We don't think of it that way, but it truly is a, a form of electricity. So this stimulation happens, it involves calcium, too. Um, calcium ion release. If you practice something, just like you study for the test that's coming up next period, what you do is get more um, neurotransmitter available at this end and more receptors at that end so that the same stimulation produces a much better um, zooming of that message through the pathway. Okay, So that's long-term potentiation. Now Molecular memory sometimes is a word people use for it. When we tried this on our, in our mice, the way it's graphed here, you see at the arrow, that's when an electrical stimulation was applied. This is done in um, slices of the hippocampus, and it's done so it's a very in vitro situation, and the stimulation's applied, and um, this electrical stimulation will follow a path, and if you do it, again, you, know, you, you can measure the strength of the path that was established. At four weeks old, it's the same for wild type and mutant mice. We tried older mice, four months old, and now we see a difference. After the stimulation, the mutants have much weaker long-term potentiation, which relates to the movement of calcium in their cells, and at the larger level, relates to their ability to form memories. This I just had to throw in. You know, when I showed you at the beginning, the picture of um, mice, the wild type of mutant mice clinging to the underside of the cage. I showed you data from the first six weeks. We actually did it a lot longer than that. We went out to 15, 14 weeks, and we were very excited at first, and then we got really depressed because from this point on there was no difference. We're thinking, why did our wild types suddenly stop holding on as long? And then it kind of dawned on me, they're smart. <laughs> they realized that well, I mean, did you ever have to do that flex arm hang in fifth or sixth grade where you just, <laughs> if you're like the best in the class or, you know, second, you're really competitive, you hang on as long as you can. If you're kind of way down there like I was, 
you know the sooner I let go, the sooner this misery ends. Right? <laughs> the mice are figuring that out. And there's, it doesn't hurt that bad to land in a pillow of my own bedding. I think that's what happened there. They didn't tell me that, but I think that's what happened. Now that we've seen what we've seen with learning and memory with those other tests, I think the wild type mice learned and the mutant mice, nothing changed. They just kept hanging on as long as they could. So, the absence of nuclear BMP2 in the nuclei of mice causes learning and memory deficits, impaired long-term potentiation in older but not younger mice, which has some interesting implications for age-related dementia, and then also the muscle dysfunction with this potential cramping. We also looked at um, another, we looked at cells in culture and the effect of nuclear BMP2 on them. Before we look at this data, I've got to explain a little bit about how to read it and what it, well, yeah, how to read it. This represents a cell cycle. So I'm sure you've all learned about how the cell cycle has different parts. G1, growth phase. S phase is synthesis of DNA. G2, more growth. M phase is mitosis. So mitosis is when the cell splits in two. So growing, growing. Here the DNA is getting copied to have a double set. So that then in mitosis, the cell can divide and each new cell has a complete set of DNA. What you see here is data from a flow cytometer. We run cells through this flow cytometer and there was a dye that binds to DNA in the cells. So on the y-axis here, number of cells, and over here, this channel is measuring the intensity of the dye in each cell. So the more DNA, the stronger that, that signal will be. So this big peak right here is diploid cells that are in G1 phase. Okay, they have a single diploid set of DNA. When they get into here and start copying their DNA, then they get more and more and more until they're completely copied and you have a double set. So we can look from here, this is about 60. We can go over to about 120. This would be cells that are just about to undergo mitosis. They're in G2. They've copied all their DNA and they split and they come through in this category with the diploid set of DNA. Okay, so you see how that breaks down? Now, look what we found. We took cells in culture and we overexpressed nuclear BMP2 in them. So this is the opposite of the mice. The mice are lacking it. Now these cells have too much of it. In human kidney cells, just normal cells, not with nuclear BMP2, there's our distribution of cells in the cell cycle. About 42% of the cells are in that um, G1 phase. By the way, let me back up and show you one more point here. So G1 phase, this part of the cell cycle can be very uh, variable in its length. Once a cell passes this checkpoint, it's sometimes called the restriction point or R point, once it passes that, it goes through here at kind of a, a common length of time. It just keeps going. But then they get into here and they can wait longer, shorter, can pull out of the cell cycle and become quiescent for a while. So there's variability here. Okay, back to this data. 42% of the cells are in some point of S phase or have copied their DNA and the rest here. When we add nuclear BMP2, look at the difference in the size of those peaks. 53% of the cells are now have entered into this cell cycle rather than staying in um, G1 or G0. We did it with another cell type. These were cancer cells, a human colon cancer cell line. Here's how they normally look. And this actually is pretty small, smaller than the kidney cells were. But when we overexpress nuclear BMP2, look how much it increased. So those cells, just having nuclear BMP2 in there is pushing them forward in the cell cycle. That equates to more rapid cell division. So if putting too much BMP2 into cells speeds up cell division, does the lack of this then in mice make them resistant to cancer? That's our next question. Unfortunately, I can't tell you the answer because this is what we're working on right now. That's what we predict though. Cells, mice that are lacking nuclear BMP2, maybe they'll be a little more resistant to cancer. Here's how you can test that. We um, have a chemical called azoxymethane that we can inject into the mice and it causes colon cancer in normal mice. That's what it does. Um, so we can do that. We know we will get tumors in normal mice and then we can compare mutant mice do they have more tumors? Do they have less? I'm predicting less. 
Here's what it looks like when you look at them. So this is not our data. I just pulled this off um, another paper to illustrate how you do it. But this is the GI tract part of it, just a part, the colon, um, from mice. And you see those little nodules? So what they were doing in this experiment was testing these um, things that were supposed to inhibit colon cancer from forming. And you can see the difference they got here compared to these with all those nodules up higher. And we don't even have to let the cancer get to the point. These, these mice were probably not in good shape, but you can see little lesions. So it's more like um, colonoscopy that we, some of you <laughs> are older, older than 50 and familiar with that. Others of you think you'll never have to worry about it. But we do those on humans because you can catch cancer before there's any sign of it whatsoever. So that's kind of the stage we're hoping to look at it. So very early and just look for aberrant crits in the colon and they'll tell us if there's precancerous lesions coming. So within a few months we should have some answers to that. So in conclusion, where I think we are now is that this nuclear BMP2 protein, we've shown that it affects learning and memory, um, it affects muscle function, and there's potentially a connection to the rate of cell division, which is a potential cancer connection. And um, we're, we're working on it a lot moving forward right now, but I think it provides a really interesting connection between all of these which are related to aging. Um, and, and all are very common things around us. So I'll finish with acknowledgments. People in my lab who did most of the work. Brett Nichols is a master's student who did all the cell cycle analysis. Jamie Mayo um, made the mouse in the, the whole construct, everything that went into that. Jenny Feline um, was a, working on the very first discovery of nuclear BMP2. So a few years ago, Lena Schmidt, I put their degrees by the way, so you can see how many of these were working as bachelor students. She did muscle studies, he did muscle. Ryan did those um, behavioral studies we talked about. Brad Evenson in Chad Hancock's lab at BYU did muscle studies with this. Jeff Edwards um, in his lab, these two did the long-term potentiation studies. And we also had help from Jeff Barrow and Mario Capecchi with getting the mouse made in the first place and funding through the NIH and from the BYU Cancer Research Center for um, Brant Nichols and Jamie Mayo. Both had summer fellowships that supported their work. We'll uh, leave that up because that slide represents my whole department at BYU. We're the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Biology. There are the names of all the different faculty. I know it's really hard to read, but if you are sitting there as we talk about, or if you have any questions, you can kind of look at that too and see if there's anybody there you might like to consider coming and doing your graduate degree with. So with that, I will stop. <laughs>